The brain is wider than the sky. Welcome to Nature Magic. Today I'm talking to Janet Jones. Janet applies brain science to the training of horses and riders. She earned her PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, and taught the neuroscience of perception, language, memory, and thought for 23 years. Janet trained horses at a large stable early in her career and later ran a successful horse training business of her own. She has schooled hundreds of green or difficult horses and competed in hunter, jumper, halter, reining, and Western pleasure disciplines. Her 2020 book, Horse Brain, Human Brain, has been hugely successful and is being translated into seven languages. Hi, Janet. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I feel very, very blessed. Um, it's lovely to see you on Zoom today. What's the weather like where you are? I'm doing great. Hi, Mary. It's really nice to see you too. I'm over here in the Rocky Mountains and um, we have a beautiful spring morning here. It's afternoon or evening, I think, where you are. Um, that, that's yeah. right. I'm in Kimbara and it's actually a chilly spring day today. So we've put our jumpers back on. It's five o'clock in the evening over here or the afternoon. So I read your book, Horse Brain, Human Brain, and it really, oh my goodness, it's got so much in it. And looking on amazon.co.uk, you've over 500 five-star reviews. It's been such a successful book, and I'm not surprised because it's a, it's a beautiful book. It really brings um, all the new knowledge that we've learned. As you said, in the last 40 years, we've learned so much more about the horse and the horse um, brain. First of all, I'd love it if you could read the beautiful poem by Emily Dickinson that you put in the front of your book. Okay. Uh, this has been one of my favorite poems for most of my life. I came upon it when I was a teenager. And um, so um, Emily Dickinson wrote this sometime around 1862. The brain is wider than the sky for put them side by side. The one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, as syllable from sound. That is so beautiful. And anybody that's listening, I just recommend you keep going back and listening to that poem a few times and let it sink in because it's, um, yes, very, very beautiful. So the first really thing I'd like to ask you, Janice, is what led you to write this book, Horse Brain, Human Brain? It came to a time in my life when, um, I had been teaching neuroscience for about 25 years, and I had been riding, um, continuing with horses as a separate kind of thing. And I got to the point where um, I opened a small training business, and um, I had trained many years before that uh, for a very large stable in a much, much bigger kind of um, setting. And, uh, but I didn't have the brain science background at that time. And so suddenly here I was in this um, new uh, small training business. And of course, horse trainers tend to get um, difficult horses and green horses, horses that are, are, not, are not behaving exactly right, or maybe they don't know exactly what they should be doing quite yet. And so I was faced very frequently with clients who would send horses to me and say in a, in a very annoyed tone that the horse was misbehaving. He's not doing this right. He's not doing that right. We've got all these problems. And I'm really hoping that you can solve these problems and uh, teach this horse what he needs to know. And so I would watch these horses and ride them. And uh, sometimes I was also giving their owners lessons 
in writing them. And I realized that many of the misbehaviors that people were referring to were actually misunderstandings. And they were based on the fact that the human riders and owners um, and maybe previous trainers sometimes didn't really realize the difference between a horse's brain and a human brain. They didn't understand exactly how a horse experiences the world. And so they were trying to apply our own human ways of thinking to an animal that has a brain that cannot think in that way. It doesn't have the physical capacity to do that. So that was what really kind of led me to this notion that um, that a lot of these things were misunderstandings and that maybe if I explained to people how horses' brains worked, that would help them understand and realize that they themselves needed to change their behavior in order to get the kind of behavior that they wanted from their horses. So um, I guess another way of looking at, at this at a more general level, I wrote the book out of a desire to help horses. Um, I feel that horses are basically in the same position that you and I would be if we were suddenly without our knowledge or expectation, simply plunked down in a foreign land. We didn't know the language. We didn't know the food. We didn't know where the bathroom was. We didn't know how to find water. We didn't know anything. We didn't know anything about the culture or the currency or anything at all. And no one was there to really teach us. Instead, people were just expecting us to figure out what we should do. I think that's a very difficult position for any human being to be in. And I think that too often we do that with our horses. We plunk them down in a human world and we simply expect them to figure it out. And we forget that we actually need to teach them step by step what we expect. So those were sort of the twin you know, um, drivers of my desire to write the book. Yeah, because I think um, people say, you know, oh, the old ways are the good ways, but the old ways are not the good ways. We know more now. We know we so know. much more and, and we have to change. Um, and there's much, we have a lot of new knowledge that we can apply. And it seems to me that if we have this knowledge, why not apply it? Exactly. And I was actually thinking before you said about being plonked down in a foreign land, it would be a little bit like if somebody said, now you have to go and learn ballet, which I've never done in my life. And your teacher is speaking Urdu or Russian. And, you know, yeah. they're, they're saying, you know, do a pirouette, run around there. And you have no idea what they're saying. They get angry yeah. if you try and leave. <laughs> <laughs> so um and we, we'll move on later to sort of positive reinforcement but um can you explain to people the basic differences for the horse brain to the human brain so we can get a little bit of insight into it I'll give you some basics um one of the things that i discovered in doing all of this work is that there are many many differences between these two brains and um so uh, at the very most basic level, there are sensory differences. The horse does not perceive the world the same way that we do. So when, when we stand next to a horse or we sit on top of a horse and we look out at the world in front of us, the view that we have is completely different from the view that the horse has. We humans tend to forget that because our brains rely primarily on vision. It's our number one sense. And the human brain, um, actually one third of the human brain is devoted to the sense of vision. So that's a lot. That's a really, a, you know, that means that our brains are really biased toward the notion of seeing the world in a particular way. Horses 
brains do not have that bias. And vision is far less important to horses than it is to humans. So we have to remember when we're out there working with a horse that what the horse sees is, number one, totally different from what we see. And what the horse sees, number two, is not all that critical to him. What's really critical to the horse is the sense of smell. And I think that we have um, under, grossly underestimated the horse's ability to smell um, in terms of our training and our working with horses in general. It's so, so fascinating. Do you speak in the book about some feral horses? They're actually probably just horses that were turned loose in the wild. But when the drought came, they turned up at the campsites and tried to turn on the taps or the faucets yeah. because they could smell the water from miles away. Um, how can we incorporate the sense of smell into training with horses? I think there are all kinds of different things that we can do. I've noticed in my own work with my own horses and with training horses that um, just the, um, the understanding that smell is important allows you to anticipate and understand a lot of the behaviors that horses produce. So there's another story that you might remember from the book. Um, in which a young horse who was being taught just the preliminaries of jumping over low fences um, was doing beautifully for several months. And then one day he stopped at a fence and, um, and he stopped repeatedly. And we were all quite puzzled because um, this horse had never even hesitated at a jump before. It just didn't seem like him at all. And we tried to figure out all the different possible reasons. You know, was he tired? Was he was it facing the wrong way? Was the sun casting a shadow that wasn't common to him? All of these things. And each one of them we had to refute because they just didn't really make much sense in that setting. And we finally realized, actually, I didn't realize this until several days later. So you know how that is. You always think of the perfect response about three days after you should have. <laughs> but several days later, I was still puzzling about this in my mind. And I realized that the horse was stopping because the owners of this location had several large dogs that liked to lie on the opposite side of this very low but solid fence. And from the side that we were jumping, you couldn't see the dogs, but the horse, and of course, they weren't there the day that we were jumping the fence, um, but the horse could smell those dogs. Now, I don't know for sure, the horse never verified for me that it was his sense of smell that caused this problem to happen, but that is my best guess. And that would be an example of something that can be very helpful to, um, to at least ponder and sometimes realize, become aware of, and move the dogs away from that location. Find them someplace outside of the arena where they can lie in the shade um, so that the horse does not have to trot up to a fence that four large dogs have been lying on the opposite side of. Um, and and leaving their scent there, and there's Isn't that, yeah. we know we know from the equine sense of smell that a horse would be able to smell that a full week, seven days after the dogs had left. It's all so fascinating, and as you say in the book, it's very hard to test horses and expensive to get a hundred horses together to do a test on them. So we have tests on sheep and things like that, but it's quite hard to sort of identify all that. And the visual differences with the horses, you had said in the book to look at, you can Google the sight of a horse um, as to human sight and that people have done sort of simulations. And yes. the, green, the reds and the greens are greys, their acuity, so their sharpness, um, difference in depth and perception, the focus, and the colours that really stick out to them are yellow and turquoise. So their actual, the sight is completely different and, we, and their blind spots. Would you talk a little bit about the difference in vision? Yes, um, 
all of those things that you mentioned are accurate differences. And another difference that you, you didn't happen to mention, and I'll bring that one up since you didn't. Um, we humans like to, uh, our brains like to make a lot of assumptions. Actually, that's a very true fact about human brains is that they're designed to make predictions. And predictions often fall into the category of assumptions. And one of the assumptions that we have made is that horses have great night vision. And they really don't. Um, it is true that a horse's nocturnal vision is a little bit better than a human's. But if you think about it, human nocturnal vision is virtually non-existent. So, you know, to say that a horse's is a little bit better is not really saying very much. Um, horses can make out the edges of objects, that the outlines of objects at night, uh, just enough in order to, um, you know, to not run into them. Um, but that's about it. And so one thing that uh, many people have not realized is that it takes a horse twice as long as a human to adapt his eyes to a dark location. So if you take a horse from a pasture, for example, and lead him into a barn that doesn't have any windows, and it might be relatively dark, your horse cannot see the inside of that barn nearly as well as you can. It will seem dark to you in there. And you might think, oh, but horses can see in the dark, no problem. Well, they can't see in the dark at all until their pupils have adapted to the dark, to the dimness. Isn't that, that so interesting? It yeah. takes us about 20 minutes to fully adapt, and it takes a horse 45 minutes to fully adapt. Wow. So, yeah. um, you know, you lead a horse into a barn, you have to remember to the horse that is the equivalent of going walking into a dark bottle of ink and the horse is not going to be relying on his vision in there he's going to rely on his smell so if there are you know dogs or um other people children all kinds of things going on inside that barn the horse can't see them he can smell them and the smell is going to make him probably a little bit nervous about yeah. what's in there because yeah. He can smell it, but he can't see it. It explained so well in this book, which I'd never understood before, really. I had a very good horse that won lots of competitions and he would face a massive fence out on the eventing field. And we could be walking down the lane and a fly would make him jump, you know, 10 feet in yeah. the air. And you explained how they have this incredible sense for motion because obviously they're prey animals and yeah. they're looking for the, the predator has soft sounds and 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 sort of repeated little motions small motions small motions and soft sounds and it just clicked and i say it, well he's obviously amazingly he was amazingly you know tuned into that yes uh, yes and so you know um there are certain things that we assume horses are really good at that they're not. So again, to keep up with our example of vision, horses do not have near the acuity that humans have in vision. They cannot see the sharpness of details that we can see just with 2020 vision. Um, a horse's vision is more like 2050 or 2060, uh, which is fairly fuzzy, really. Um, but on the other hand, a horse's brain has much sharper motion detection cells than a human's brain has. And so the horse can literally see super rapid, small movements that humans cannot detect. So when sometimes, you know, we're all walking along out there in the, in the woods and we get angry at a horse that shies and we say something like, oh, come on, there's nothing there. We don't know that. Yeah, or oh, that was a fly. That was actually a fly. <laughs> there might very well be something right there, and the horse might have seen something move that was such a small, rapid movement that our eyes were not capable of picking it up, but his were. 
Yeah, and it isn't it incredible that he is so tuned into the predator, and he know, as you said in the book, which I'd never thought of before, he knows we're a predator because our eyes are on the front of the head. Yeah, that's oh. the, you know the obvious sign to any prey animal. It's not a it's not a mystery to figure out what sort of animal is a predator because the frontal eyes give us away instantly. Absolutely. And what, out of all these things, what would you like people to know um, about the horse's brain that might help them to be a better trainer? What would your sort of top bit of advice be? You know, the, the biggest piece of advice that I would have for that is, is going to sound ridiculously simple on the surface. Um, but the most important thing that people need to know is simply that equine brains are very different from human brains. So a horse cannot possibly perceive the world or learn or think or respond in the way that a human would. It's not within his physical capacity to do that. Uh, It would be like asking a bird to swim or a fish to fly. It's just not something that he can do. So I think that we have to respect what the horse can do and what the horse cannot do. And then work with that horse on a daily basis to teach him what is expected. Um, Too often, I think we simply demand or expect that a horse just meets our expectations without ever showing the horse what those expectations are. And in my mind, that is just simply not fair to the horse that's that's um using an animal in an inappropriate way uh whereas if we help the horse to figure all of these things out then we can expect him to follow his behavior according to what he has learned and that's fine i'm perfectly willing to require a horse to follow the manners that he has learned but I'm not willing to expect a horse to follow manners that he doesn't know anything about. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so important to have you on the show as a voice for the horse so that we can understand. I I like that idea. Thank you. Yes, because animals uh, don't have a voice in our own, the way we can speak through language. But um, now if people are like sponges, they want to learn, especially horse people. And I think yes. you, you, if you look at the diagrams in the book, you can see they don't have the section in the brain for analysis. Isn't that right. correct? So they can't, uh, they, it just goes straight from stimulus to action. So we That's can't exactly expect correct. them. Yeah, we can't expect them to analyze anything and predict or do any of these things. So we no. need. To... No, and, and yet, I mean, we can teach them um, to delay their responses just long enough to pay attention to what their human is telling them with body language. You know, we we can train them to do that. So a lot of times when I talk about the um, physiological background of shying, people kind of get the idea that, well, in that case, there's nothing we can do because these are all innate parts of the horse's brain. So we're just gonna have to put up with the fact that a horse is gonna shy all the time. That's not quite true. There are many innate aspects of all brains, horse and human brains, that we can't remove or change, but we can lay learning over the top of them and we can cause um, horses or dogs or other people to, um, to simply delay their response for a a second or two seconds long enough for them to pay attention to how their human is responding to this particular situation. And and that's basically exactly how we go about training a horse that he doesn't really need to shy at all of the things that his prey brain would dictate. As you said in the book, you know, the horse learns so quickly and forget so slowly. So just be careful what you teach them. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, what, would, what would you say is true horsemanship? Oh, well, um, so that's a 
topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, the last chapter of Horse Brain, Human Brain is devoted to that question completely. And in my opinion, the ultimate definition of true horsemanship can be explained fully in four words. The horse comes first. That's Wonderful. All it is. It's very simple. The horse always comes first. It doesn't matter what the issue is. The horse still comes first. Um, you know, I grew up in a setting where um, none of us kids were allowed to eat breakfast or dinner until after the horses were fed. That way, the argument was that that way we would never forget to feed our animals because our own stomachs would remind us that the animals had to be fed before we could be fed. Um, if your horses didn't have clean water, you didn't have water. If your horse's housing was not clean, your housing was not going to be clean. If you mistreat a horse under saddle, you know, as a kid, you make mistakes. You yell at your horse now and then when, you know, if you were older, you would know better not to do that. But every now and then, somebody would always say something, you know, that dumb horse did such, threw me off, you know, left me in the forest, and I had to walk all the way home. And I, anything like that, if you mistreated or even misspoke about a horse under saddle, you wouldn't ride. And so on. And I think that too often today, people think of horses as human servants. Horses are not our servants. Horses are magnificent animals of their own. They have their own dignity. They have their own way of living. And true horsemen care for their horses first. Um, they put the horse's needs first and always honor the responsibility to protect the horse's health and welfare at any cost. Because like you said a few minutes ago, the horse can't do that for himself. He has to have human protection. We keep our horses captive. So we have to take the responsibility to protect that. Yeah, the horse comes first. That's absolutely lovely. Um, do you, have you had any sort of profound or serendipitous experience with horses um, or while you were writing the book? that you might like to speak about? Uh, yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. I, I can't say that I've had any really special, specific experiences like that during the process of writing the book. Instead, what I would have to say is that um, I have experiences like that every day. Um, I feel honored to work with such magnificent animals every day. So when a horse rests his chin on my shoulder and sighs a long relaxed breath, I relax too. And when I'm riding and I'm focused on the horse's mind and body to such an extent that the entire world disappears from my awareness, that is a profound experience. Um, when I, uh, on the occasions when I am able for a moment or two to enter the mind of a horse and see the world the way he sees it, that is a very profound experience. Um, every time I see horses try for their riders, despite poor aids or a lot of confusion, I feel so proud of them for trying. Because, you know, when you really think about it, these animals don't have to try for us. You know, it's, it's not, I mean, there, there's nothing, there's no giant reward over on the opposite side of the fence that would cause them to jump it on their own each time they jump. So just the fact that these horses are so generous that they would try to do things for us just because we ask them to try. Absolutely um, beautiful. I think all of those things, to me, all of those things are um, really profound experiences. So it, that's I, that, I yeah. feel so honored to work with these animals every day. 
I, abs I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, well, I think we know what the, the question I had asked you, what the importance of the book, but would you like to speak briefly about what's the importance of this book and what you hope it will accomplish? Um, I think the biggest importance of this book is that is for the comfort and welfare of horses all around the world. Um, we expect a lot of horses even when we aren't asking them for Olympic performances, but just a horse that lives out back in the pasture behind the house. Um, we, we expect that horse to do a lot of different things that, uh, that are perhaps a little more complicated to a horse than we realize. And so I really hope that horse brain, human brain, will show people how generous our prey animals are to let us ride on their backs um, and how hard they try to cooperate with us, even when we don't make our expectations clear. Absolutely. And I would just love to read a little bit from the very end of the book. Even okay. though the book, the book is quite scientific, but it's very um, readable for any level of um, sort of learning but just at the end and you're talking about horsemanship and you say horses show us how to set clear boundaries master nonverbal communication break goals into ordered steps and practice the best principles of learning and motivation they teach us to conquer our fears offer compassion build trust let go of anxiety and behave with transparency. And I just think those are very beautiful words. Thank um, you. If horses did have a voice, what is the one thing that you think they would request as a species? Teach me. Brilliant. <laughs> Janet, thank you. One, I think that's the, the one thing that they would ask us most is just teach me. Yeah, make it easier for them. So, you know, if we were in that foreign country, could somebody can approach us and show us how to do the things and make it easier for us to live in this world. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners about? Well, yes and no. There are a million other things, of course. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, I understand that we all have limitations on our time. Um, you know, mostly I just want to thank everyone for their interest in the book. I have to say that the reception around the world to horse brain, human brain has been amazingly satisfying and really wonderful to see. It's obvious to me that horse people genuinely want to help their horses and to understand their horses. And um, the fact that they're taking the time to read this book and to learn a lot of material about equine and human brains that is not always easy to understand. Um, I, I, I really respect that and I appreciate it very much. So um, the, the book is in its eighth printing already and it's only been out for a year and a half. It is an incredible <laughs> and, success. And it, yeah, and it's been, um, it's been being translated into eight different languages already and so there's really been a, a groundswell from all over the world from people who obviously want to understand how their horses brains work and i think those people are going to do their very best to apply that knowledge to their everyday work with their horses so thank you all so much for um for your interest in this Oh, thank you so much, Janice. And I do think, you know, traditional training methods, people get stuck in a rush of a habit, but it is time to change. People need to learn. Um, we need to learn the right ways to be partners with our horses. I'm going to try and read out this paragraph um, by Ronald Duncan that you have in the book, but I don't know if I'll be able to read it without tearing up. Okay. Um, but I'll try. <laughs> and so okay. it's, just, it's just another a beautiful beautiful moment in the book the horse where in this wide world can man find nobility without pride 
friendship without envy or beauty without vanity. Here, where grace is laced with muscle and strength by gentleness confined. Oh, that gave me chills. Oh, so, oh, thank you so much. So um, can you tell us how, if, if you want people to contact you, how do they do that? Or where do they get the book or anything else you'd like to add? And I'll put it in the show notes as well. Okay, that's great. Um, the book is available through all uh, distributors and both physical bookstores around the world and online retailers. And we do have distributors in on every continent. I think um, I actually have contacts with readers on six of the continents. We don't have anybody in Antarctica yet, so I'm waiting. Get on to that. <laughs> Come on, everybody. Exactly. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Are there many horses up in Antarctica? <laughs> there might be a little problem with that. I'm sure it's very cold to go outside and ride, too. Um, <laughs> But um, so so the book is available through any bookstore or online retailer. Um, in addition, you can go to my website, which is www.janet-jones.com. And you can order the book from there in any of the languages that it's available in right now. Um, and you can learn more about me. There are reviews and interviews and there's a blog on the website, um, all kinds of things like that. So that's probably the best place to go to find out more. That's really great. And thank you, Janet, for speaking up for the 60 million horses that live with us on this planet today. Yes. Thank you very much, Mary. I've appreciated this so much. It was a pleasure. Oh, it was a lot of fun. And thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Nature Magic. We are delighted to announce our official partnership with the Botany and Plant Science Department of the National University of Ireland, Galway, to be known from later this year as the University of Galway. Students from NUI will be doing various projects, including seed collection for the new native seed bank at the Botanic Gardens in Glasnevin. The very first seed donated to the seed bank was from a bee orchid from the Boran Nature Sanctuary. During lockdown, Dr. Karen Bacon from NUI developed an online botany field trip for her students. Not easy. And this concept is being developed in June as a Digi Lego Erasmus project for international students who may have accessibility issues. So they will be able to do an online botany field trip to the Borough Nature Sanctuary from anywhere in the world.